Welcome to Organizational Analysis. In this introductory lecture, I will introduce you to the concept of an organization. In so doing, it will become clear that organizations are everywhere and come in many different forms. Their ubiquity and complexity means many of our social problems are organizational in nature, and this is why we need to study organizations and to take courses on them. Also, we develop a better understanding of the world we live in and how to better manage it. Let's begin with our preconceptions and understandings. What is an organization? What's not an organization? When most of us consider organizations, we think of hospitals, schools, businesses, stores, companies, and factories. But what about families? What about voluntary associations and even street gangs? What makes something an organization or not? Where is the boundary of our concept of an organization? One of the best writers on organizations has been Richard Scott, whose work we'll draw on heavily from time to time. Scott defines organizations this way. Organizations are conceived as social structures created by individuals to support the collaborative pursuit of specified goals. Now there's a lot packed in here, so let's simplify it some. What Scott means is that organizations are groups whose members coordinate their behavior in order to accomplish shared goals or to put out a product. Given this, let's reconsider what is and is not an organization. So, if we look at this chart, we see that organizations like companies, schools, families, and voluntary associations all have certain features that, that fit our notion of uh, what an organization is. That members coordinate, that they have a shared goal, and that they put out a product. Examples that aren't organizations seem to fall short of this definition. So random collections of persons or isolated individuals have no roles, rules, or goals, patterns of recurrence in their behavior, or even a boundary to where that group begins or ends. Ambiguous cases uh, are somewhat unclear. Some features of the definition may be lacking there. Uh, so for example, with street gangs, friendship groups, and social movements, we have less clear shared goals. We have uh, porous boundaries and fluid participants that come and go. And we have less clear rules for behavior. Now that we have some sort of idea of what is and is not an organization, we can start reflecting on how common and important organizations are. Looking at this image, we see a variety of organizations. Organizations accomplish most of what society wants and needs, from socialization in schools to re-socialization through prisons or mental health care facilities, from tax collecting, public administration, protection and soldiering, to production and distribution of goods, service provision like grocery stores, preservation of culture like museums, communication like Google or Microsoft, uh, and even recreation. Organizations are the means by which many of our collective goals are pursued and accomplished. For example, would disaster relief or schooling be possible without organizations focused on those efforts? Organizations are so common that they've become a medium of modern social life. We can't imagine existing outside them. We live in a world greatly made up of formal organizations, their rules, their structures, goals, members, and all their instrumental efforts. Organizations are also collective actors or social entities that take action, use resources, own property, and enter contracts. In legal documents, often we see the organization's name listed and they've attained somewhat of a thing status. So, organizations are everywhere, but they also vary tremendously. They vary on a variety of dimensions, and one simple one is size. Some organizations are huge, like IBM, and employ hundreds of thousands of individuals. Others are very small, like a youth organization run out of someone's garage or a, a startup company of a several people. They also vary by market sector. Some organizations occur in the private industry sector, others occur in the public sector and nonprofits. They can even be voluntary associations like unions, parent-teacher associations, and religious groups. 
Their social structures vary. Some are hierarchical, like the military and football teams. Some are centralized dictatorships, like perhaps Henry Ford and Andrew Carnegie managed in the 1920s and 30s. Others have flat governance structures, like consulting firms, while yet others are horizontally differentiated into many different divisions and relatively autonomous units, like university departments. Last, organizations vary by their environmental context. They vary by the temporal context or era in which they live. The context for the federal government is very different today than it was in 1790. Moreover, a time of recession is very different than a time of economic boom. And by regional differences reflecting different cultural contexts, uh, we can also see environmental effects. For example, Euro Disney required quite a bit of adaptation of the kind of California Disneyland model. It could just be plopped down and work the same. The idea here with environment is that the same organization may not have the same effect or the same process of operating in a different time, culture, and with a different set of participants. So, organizations are everywhere, they're very important to the functioning of society, and they're very diverse. They've also changed a lot over the last 50 years and have altered American society as a result. For example, manufacturing has given away to a service industry in the United States. Women have become half the labor force. Part-time subcontracting has grown and so on. The point is that the organizational world that we live in is changing right underneath us. Because organizations are everywhere and varied, they're often a source of consternation and social problems. All too often, our problems are organizational ones, and we want to reform the firms we interact with. Through this course, you'll gain a better appreciation of organizational complexity and the difficulties of redirecting organizations in desired directions. Sometimes coordination and contracts fall apart, and they need to be renegotiated. Schools don't live up to expectations and need re reorganization, like Michelle Rhee here, uh, and her efforts to become chancellor of the New York City schools. Sometimes a military needs reform. For example, the United States has gone through a, a gender biases concerns in terms of putting women in uh, frontline combat. And finally, governments can fail and require regulation and corruption, much like the Nixon kind of Watergate hearings. So participants propose and implement reforms within organizations in an effort to change them, to make them better, to solve their problems. Many reforms fail long before they are ever implemented, and those that are implemented often end up looking like something very different from what they plan to be. Many reforms are rejected outright, or they are dramatically adapted to the local context. Some of you have been managers and know what I mean. Part of the, the goals of this course is to help you understand the difficulties of reform and to come to new models and new modes of implementation that may make you more successful at it. Much of my research focuses on educational organizations, like schools and universities. So many of the reforms I see try to change the nature of schooling, and many of these reforms fail. In fact, they fail so routinely that I had a teacher give me a list of 45 failed school reforms adopted in very piecemeal fashion that went through a school over the last 20 years. Many of these are jargon and hard to interpret but they often target change efforts on certain organizational features over others. For example, some are focused on the social structure. Take number eight, lead teachers. That attempts to insert an additional level in the flat hierarchy of faculty roles. Others present a technology or schooling process that caters to a particular goal. For example, number 13, heterogeneous grouping. This gives students an active role in their education and emphasizes a goal of equality. And yet others attempt to manage pressures from the external environment, like number 12, national certification, and number 27, which concerns stakeholders in the environment. Most of these reforms are developed and tested in one school and then packaged and applied to many other contexts. Unfortunately, the local environment often differs from the original testing ground, so the reform's goals may not be valued by the local managers, or the targeted change may dis disrupt other valued tasks and missions. 
In addition, there's a governance structure in place within most schools and districts that's threatened by external plans of change that usurp their established coordination patterns. In short, every reform emphasizes certain rules, roles, participants, and goals, thereby supplanting others or shifting attention elsewhere. This often creates problems for what was there beforehand. This course will help you think more deeply and clearly about how organizational reforms are generated and implemented, and what factors li likely contribute to their success and failure.